Um, Hubble tested quite a few galaxies and he found, this is a very important graph, the velocity at which they're moving away against their distance. Uh, he found surprisingly they fit a very, very straight line indeed. There's a very, very close correlation between how far, if here's Edwin Hubble on the Earth, how far away the galaxy is, okay, and how quickly it's moving away. The further away the galaxy is, the faster it's moving. Okay, put a galaxy over here, travelling even faster, and so on. Okay, and they're directly proportional. If you take a galaxy moving away from us and compare it with one twice as far away, that galaxy will be moving exactly twice as fast. Okay. Now, um, we drew this on a graph like this. This is now known as, uh, well, now known as Hubble's law. Okay. And it poses more problems than it solves, as we're going to see this morning. All right, this is roughly where we got to last time, I think. Okay? Um, as I think we mentioned last time, this is a bit of a problem, because how on earth do these galaxies know? If you went to a galaxy a million times further away, how does it know it's got to travel at exactly a million times faster than that galaxy, as measured from this particular planet on a tiny spiral arm of a small galaxy inside a bunch of galaxies millions of light years away? It just doesn't make sense. How on earth... Can this be true? Okay. And in fact, it's um, a bit worse than that, but let's put some numbers to it. Um, there's a very handy way of remembering this, which um, I'm going to cheat a little bit and do. Let's imagine we picked a galaxy which was one mega parsec away. Now, this is the unit of distance we use when we're on this massive scale. We don't measure distances to galaxies outside the local group in kilometres because the numbers would be enormous. Okay. So you'll be familiar, let's just remind ourselves, with uh, the light year, which is the distance a beam of light travels in a year. It's an awful lot of kilometres. And how many kilometres in the light year isn't particularly important because almost everything is a decent fraction of a light year away. And so we use it as the sort of unit of distance. In cosmology, and once you get outside the galaxy, we tend to work in a unit called the parsec. Okay. Uh, exactly why, because it seems a bizarre choice, I'll explain in a moment. But in this section, we tend to use the parsec, which is 3.26 light years. I think you're supposed to know that for the exam, actually. Why would you work in parsecs that are equal to 3.26 light years? We'll come back to that in another section, all right? But that's what I mean by small p, small c, means a parsec, 3.26 light years, okay? Now, 3.26 light years, let's just think about the scale of this. 3.26 light years will get you about there. If our Milky Way galaxy is 100,000 light years across... 3.26 light years is just a tiny, tiny distance away. It's no good to us at all. So we use, as we often do in science, we put a capital M for mega, just like speed of computers and stuff and memory sticks and stuff. Mega parsec obviously means a million parsecs. Okay? So we're imagining here a galaxy, let's say, which is one million parsecs away. All right? 3.26 million light years. And almost, well, it's not actually... In fact, it's getting much, much worse. Let's suppose it's moving away at about 50 kilometres per second. All right? So we look at a galaxy one megaparsec away, and we find it's moving at 50 kilometres per second. OK? Now, if you look it up, that value isn't quite right. I think it was right about 50 years ago. All right? Um, astronomers have been measuring this value for quite a long time. It's, it's been changing... So the accurate value of this is some way off 50, but 50 is a nice round number, so we can see what we're doing with the numbers. Okay. Then if you took another galaxy, which is two megaparsecs away, then you can see how it's going to work. We're going to end up with it travelling at 100 kilometres per second. And a galaxy three megaparsecs away would be travelling at 150 and so on. Okay. So the gradient of this line is basically, it looks the right mouthful when you write it down, that looks very complicated, but hopefully with this you can see what we're on about, all right? 50 kilometres per second, that's how fast you're going, for every megaparsec that you are away. What that means is, in simple terms, a galaxy one megaparsec away will be travelling at 50 kilometres per second. A galaxy at two megaparsecs will be travelling at 100. A galaxy at 10 megaparsecs will be doing 500, and so on, okay? And this is known as, this number is known as the, the Hubble constant, okay? It isn't 50, and it never really was 50, actually. 
I think in the late 80s you could get away with 50. It's well, it's 67 now or something, I don't know. Um, you can often tell the age of a textbook by what value it has for the Hubble constant. Um, in, in the past few decades, astronomers have been measuring more and more accurately. I always use 50 on the board. Are you with me? Because if this was 67, that's going to be... Yeah, exactly. So it's much easier just to use 50, but um, you don't need to know the exact value. If, they, if you need to use it in the exam, they would have to tell you what value to use, so you don't need to know the exact value. But I think it's now about 67 or something. Is everybody happy with the idea, though? Yeah? Every megaparsec you go, you get a certain amount more speed. Okay? And this is really a huge problem. Okay? This is a huge issue, because how on earth can this be true? How can galaxies work in this way? Okay? And that's what we're going to have a look at this morning. Uh, let's see if we can solve the problem here, because how on earth are these galaxies out here, or even the galaxies here, how do they know? And as I say, the results Hubble took, they were absolutely, all right, it's one of the straightest graphs in science. The correlation is really, really strong. Now, the important thing to get your head around is what's actually happening. Hubble has discovered, this is the reason his name's on the Space Telescope, uh, as I think I mentioned in the previous lesson, he's discovered that we live in an expanding universe, okay? We live in an expanding universe, that means the universe is getting bigger, okay? Now, very importantly, you need to understand exactly what we mean by that, okay? Expanding universe isn't quite as simple as it sounds, okay? And if you haven't quite got your head around how the universe is expanding, this will continue to be um, a bit of a problem, okay? Many people think of the universe expanding a bit like, well, here's a room, let's say, window or something like that, okay? A table, whatever. And here's the universe, like a bomb or something, and somebody lights the blue touch paper, and then the universe explodes and sends bits of universe flying all over the room. So if you think of a bomb going off in the middle of the room or something, that's one way of thinking about the universe expanding and everything sort of flying out, okay? Now, on that way of thinking about it, there are a number of problems, okay? First of all, this business here about Hubble's law and the Hubble constant is massively confusing. How on earth do the galaxies at different distances know they've all got to travel at certain speeds? And the second problem is, if this is how you're thinking about the universe expanding, what does the fact that all galaxies are moving away from us, every galaxy Hubble measured in every direction outside the local group is moving away, if that's true and that's how the universe is expanding, where must we be in the universe? We must be in the middle, must we? Which It's not impossible, but it seems a bit unlikely. Okay? So there's a problem there to do with... We, in theory, we're at the centre of the universe, and all the other galaxies have arranged their speeds just perfectly to make Hubble's law work. Again, that isn't impossible, but it does push the bounds of probability, doesn't it? Okay? What you need to do is to have a better picture in your mind of how the universe is expanding. Okay? Like many simple phrases in science, it's actually got a bit more in there than it at first seems. This is the way to think about it, and the best um, I can find of doing this i will have to edit this when I can't blow the balloon up or something. Okay. Um, I've got a balloon here which has got some spots on. <coughs> it's a green balloon, as you can see, with, with all the spots on. If it comes out on the camera. And what I want you to do is to think about... Pick, pick one of those spots, whichever one's your favourite. Right. Imagine that's our Milky Way galaxy. Okay. There's loads of other spots around. And what I'm going to do is to blow the balloon up. Okay. Now, if you can find the one that you're particularly fond of earlier on, I suppose it was that one. Okay. Uh, can you imagine living on that star? What would you have seen all the other stars do just then? Being away from it. Yeah. You would have seen them all away. Does that mean that star's in the middle? No. Doesn't, does it? Alright. This is a better way of thinking about the expanding universe. In fact, if I lived on any of these stars, what would I see all the others do? They'd all move away. Which of us is in the centre? We're not, are we? I mean, you could sort of argue that one is, I suppose, but they're not really, are we? Where's the centre of the expansion? It's actually inside the balloon, isn't it? But do you see how we've solved this problem? <coughs> Let's see what the problem is here. Using that, we've sorted out the centre problem, haven't we? 
Think of the universe expanding like a balloon being blown up. And then the problem of who's in the middle doesn't make any difference. If you prefer, you can have a cake. Think of a cake, maybe. You put currants or sultanas or something in it. You put the cake in the oven. Imagine you lived on one of the sultanas or whatever. Cake gets bigger, yeah, as it, as it gets cooked. If you lived on that sultana, what would you see all the other sultanas doing? They'd all move away, wouldn't they? And which sultana's in the middle? Doesn't make any difference, does it? Okay, so this blowing up the balloon kind of thing is a much better way of understanding the expansion. There is no center, okay? Not in the dimensions of the space that these galaxies live in. Um, the center, there isn't one, all right? Which bits of space are expanding? All of them, yeah? And very importantly, that's what this means. It doesn't look like much of a phrase, but actually it's kind of almost got a double meaning. What's actually expanding? And let me put the question differently. Are these stars actually moving? Let me show you. Stupid balloon. Um, have they actually moved? I need to think what you mean by movement, don't we? Let's try it again. Now, one way of understanding moving would be if this particular star here decided I don't want to live here anymore and it moved to somewhere else. Yeah, that's moving, isn't it? If you like moving house, you just think, I don't like living here. I want to move to another part of the universe. Which of the stars has done that? None of them, has it? What's actually expanding then is the universe, not things in it. And that sounds a bit of a bonkers phrase to say, but when we think about all the galaxies moving away from each other, like this, they're all moving away, are, they actually, are the galaxies actually moving? They've got little engines driving them through the universe. Like, I'm moving through the universe now. I was over there, and now I'm in a different part of the universe. Which of the stars on the balloon has done that? None of them. All right? Why do these galaxies, when they look at each other, why do they see the red shifted light? They see the galaxies appearing to move away from each other. A really good way to think about it is to think about, think about, pick two galaxies, there they are. Think about the piece of balloon in between them. Think about the piece of plastic. Now why do those two stars see each other move away? Yeah? You see, it's because the universe, get it? The space of which the universe is made, the plastic of which the balloon is made, that's getting bigger. Yeah? If the universe was empty, then you'd still get this sort of expansion. They're almost like being carried on like on a wave, if you like, is one way of thinking about it. But to be very clear, we see this effect of the expanding universe <coughs> because the space between us and a distant galaxy is expanding. Alright? It's not the case that the galaxies are. And again, moving is a bit of an adequate word here. Do you follow? It's not like, I mean, here what's happening, are these bits of the exploding thing, are these bits of material, are they moving through space? In the bomb example, yes they are, aren't they? And that's why this just goes completely wrong, because that isn't what's happening to the universe. The expansion of the universe, although when you watch videos like on Horizon stuff, they show the Big Bang, like, pff, all seems like that sort of thing. You need to think a bit more carefully about it. That's not what's happening. Okay? Each of these galaxies is not moving. But what's happening is very gradually the space. Think of the balloon again. Yeah? It's that little piece of plastic between them that was that big. When I blow the balloon up, that piece of plastic becomes that big. All right? Neither galaxy has moved. Yeah? Neither galaxy has moved. What's happened is the space between them has expanded. So maybe now you can go back to that phrase, expanding the universe, yeah, and think a bit more carefully about what it actually means. It means the space of the universe is getting bigger, and as always, say, think of it like a balloon. Think of it like a balloon, and you'll be clear. Those stars haven't moved, all right? The stars and the dots and things on here haven't moved at all. What's happening? is the space between them is getting bigger, okay? What would happen then if you had another galaxy with twice as much space? If you've got two galaxies, 
And then you got another one that had twice as much rubber, elastic band between it, or rubber, or balloon between it. How much faster would that go? Do you see? Why does this galaxy appear to go twice as fast? Well, because we had this much piece of green plastic balloon between us and that one, and the one that's twice as far away, we've got twice as much balloon. How much does that expand? Same as that, same as that. So how much expansion are we going to see here? We're going to see... It's 100, isn't it? We're going to see it go twice as fast. Why is it doing anything special to make that happen? This galaxy doesn't think it's moving. All the people in this galaxy think they're at the centre of the universe. They're not moving at all. But what's happening is the space between us is getting bigger. It's all getting bigger. So if you have twice as much space, you'll see twice as much expansion. If you have three times as much space, you'll see three times as much expansion. Okay? So the other good thing with the balloon idea is it makes sense of Hubble's law. If you think of the expanding universe like a bomb going off, then... Hubble's law doesn't make any sense at all. Why should galaxies twice as far go twice as fast? There's no reason. Okay? Think of the expanding universe like a balloon, and you can see A, we're not all at the centre, and B, this is why galaxies twice as far away seem to go twice as fast. If when I blow the balloon up, you look at your next door neighbour, they'll move away quite slowly. If you look at another galaxy on the other side of the balloon, it'll appear to go much more quickly because the space, there's twice as much space between them. Okay. Is everybody happy with that? Is that sort of making sense? But you really do need to get your head around this expanding universe idea and think of it a bit like a balloon. Okay. Right. We'll just do one more bit then, I think. It's got time. Um, let's try and finish off this section on cosmology. Right. We've now understood then what's happening with the universe. The universe is expanding, not the stuff in it. The stuff in it, the galaxies, are being carried along by the expansion of the universe. The obvious question then is why? Why on earth should the universe be expanding? It's jolly good news that it is, because then we can understand how the universe works. It's a balance between expansion, for whatever reason, and gravity, which we know pulls all things in. Clearly, the universe is a balance between those two things, just like a star is a balance between gravity and radiation pressure. Okay? Now, the first of these... Uh, first real explanation to come for this, uh, we have to mention, because it was invented um, just down the road. Uh, the first explanation really for this was called uh, the steady state theory. Okay. Uh, largely invented by a guy called Fred Hoyle, uh, who lived in Bingley. Um, and he came up with this, this theory. And it's to do with, um, here we are on the Earth, Let's suppose we look out into the universe and we see galaxies. And if we look in another direction, we see galaxies as well. There's some more galaxies. Okay. If you look out into the universe, generally, on the really big scale, so by the Earth I just mean the local group, if we look outside of our local group, where gravity isn't messing things up, you see just universes, uh, sorry, you see just galaxies, and that seems to be what the universe is made of. Now, there's a very strange observation you can make, which is... If you pick a random direction, so you pick that direction, and you get a really powerful telescope, and you look in that direction, you count how many galaxies you can see, and you say, roughly, for every megaparsec that I go, how many galaxies do I see? And you come up with some number. And then you say, right, let's look at a completely different direction at right angles, and do the same thing, and then look at another direction completely at right angles and do the same thing. All right? The answer is, you get exactly the same number. Not roughly the same number, exactly the same number. Okay? The universe has a very strange property. It's got a rather grand name. The universe would appear to be isotropic. Now, isotropic means something that looks the same in all directions. So if you look that way, I don't know what the answer is, you see 50 galaxies per megaparsec, let's say. If you look in that direction, you see exactly the same number. Not the same galaxies, obviously. You see different galaxies. But if you like density, that's probably the easiest way of thinking about it. Roughly, how closely spaced are the galaxies? If you look on the very, very big scale, that's why this is a fairly 20th century kind of discovery, because you need very powerful telescopes to look enormous distances. And if you look within the local group, it doesn't work. Like Andromeda's over there, it's not over there. But if you look very big distances, how many galaxies do you see for every million light years that you go or whatever? 
you see exactly the same number. And for that reason, the universe is called is isotropic. Okay. Now, Fred Boyle said, well, the universe appears to be isotropic in the three dimensions of space. And there's this chap called Albert Einstein who keeps telling us that space is very closely linked to time. And in fact, we live in a four-dimensional universe. We have the three dimensions of space, that way, that way, and that way. And there's also this fourth dimension of time. Well, if that's true, said Fred Hoyle, what about the universe being isotropic in terms of time? It's a bit of a head-melting concept for a Thursday boy. Um, what he's basically saying is the universe would look the same on the grand scale, on the very big scale. If you looked at the universe a million years ago, or a hundred million years ago, or a thousand million years ago, obviously there'd be maybe different stars, different people obviously, different planets, the Earth might have gone by then, the Sun might have exploded... But if you look on the very, very big scale, which is what cosmology does, then on average you would see much the same sort of thing. If when you look in every direction in space, you see on average 50 galaxies per billion light years or something like that, Fred Hoyle said in that case that ought to be the same for time. The universe ought to be isotropic in terms of time, which means, here's our rough drawing of the universe, if we drew it again in a billion years' time, these galaxies probably wouldn't be the same galaxies, the stars within them would all be different, but if we did our counting thing again, in theory we'd get the same answer. What does this imply about the beginning and the end of the universe? Exactly. He hasn't got one. The universe doesn't have a beginning, nor does it have an end, because it doesn't need to. All right, Fred Hall, very great physicist going for the simplest explanation, usually being right, you don't need a beginning to the universe, and you don't need an end. Now, I can see people's brows furrowing, and people scratching their heads and wishing they hadn't done this subject. Um, you need to be a little bit careful here. Um, we are all human beings. Um, the reason we're so successful on Earth is because of our mighty brains. Um, we have higher bits of our brains, which you know dogs and lizards don't, which means we can think amazing thoughts like this. But you need to be a bit careful, because the human brain is quite... It likes certain things. Uh, it likes things that have a beginning and an end. That's why EastEnders is so abysmal. Because you watch it, and then you watch it a few weeks later, and it's the same thing going on again. And there appears to have been absolutely no progress. Phil Mitchell's in trouble with the police, and people are shouting at each other. Or Coronation Street. I don't mean to insult, if you like, EastEnders. Um, it doesn't appear to have a beginning. Oh, I can remember, I actually watched the first EastEnders. I don't think anyone in the room's old enough to have watched the first Coronation Street. That goes back a long, long time, doesn't it? Um, and it has an end. I mean, think of when you were little, I don't know, fairy tales? Princess trapped by, trapped by um monster. Prince turns up, a white horse with a sword, beats up the monster, and they lived happily ever after. It has a beginning, it has a middle, and it has an end. And what do you do? You go off to sleep happy, don't you? You can try this with, with Tiny Tots, bedtime story. Well, there was this princess, and the monster came, and... and took her off to his cave, and we, we don't really know what happened, really. Night, night. It's not going to work, is it? It's not going to work. Now, just be careful. Your brain likes things. Think about stories, literature, stuff like that. Your primate brain is fantastic at things. It can do things that crocodiles can't do and the Neanderthal man couldn't do. But it has its limitations. And you can see it in the raised eyebrows when I say it has no end, and the double raised eyebrows when it's had no beginning. Now, just be careful, because you look at the earliest writings from thousands of years ago. What did people write about? The ancient Sumerians wrote about the creation of the universe. You with me? Creation and those sort of cycles are just what we're about. We're absolutely about it. However, the universe may not care. The universe may not give a bun what you think. All right? So just be careful that with your primate brain, you think, oh, I don't like the steady state theory. No beginning and no end. Because actually, that may not be a problem. Now, there's, a, there's an obvious problem with the steady state theory. If we had Head Ho Fred Hoyle here, and we said, oh, but the universe is expanding, he would say, well, that's what universes do. That's what it's always done. Now, hang on a minute. If you get some plasticine, and you spread it out, and you spread it out, and you spread it out, what's going to happen to the density of it? The thickness of it is going to get thinner and thinner, isn't it? The universe doesn't appear to be doing that. The universe doesn't appear to be getting thinner and thinner. 
So there's a problem with the steady state theory, which means he had to invent another bit. The steady state theory comes with a bolt-on bit called the theory of continuous creation. Fred Hoyles would say, well, that doesn't matter, because every now and then, as the universe expands, new bits of matter just pop into the universe out of nowhere. Now, you don't need to have done much science to know. That doesn't sound very likely. However, under the rules of quantum physics, you can get away with that. Um, and he said, basically, as the universe expands, every now and then, a little bit of matter just pops into the universe. So that as the universe gets bigger and bigger, it doesn't get thinner and thinner. We don't see the universe getting less and less dense or more and more spread out because of this material being created by continuous creation. Now, if you talk to chemistry and physics teachers, conservation of energy, conservation of mass, you're just not supposed to do that, are you? Um, well, there's two ways around this. One is the speed at which it happens. If you can imagine, a good way to imagine this, is the Empire State Building, in New York or something. Uh, not at the moment, anyway, but it did used to be the tallest building in, in the world. So if you could imagine a, t a sort of massive Manhattan skyscraper like the Empire State Building. Can you imagine taking, it sounds like a Superman film, you take the Empire State Building out into space, all right? So out in space, you've got the Empire State Building. You then make it disappear. Can you imagine in outer space the chunk of space that the, the Empire State Building would have taken up? Well, for continuous creation to work, because actually the expanse universe is quite slow, for continuous creation to work, all you would need would be one hydrogen atom every month. So when Fred Hall says matter's created out of nowhere, you think like tables and chairs bursting at, you know, that you've never seen before. It doesn't mean that. Although we're talking about kilometres per second, on the scale of the universe, that isn't actually very fast. When I blow the balloon up, I'd need to blow the balloon up very, very slowly. For continuous creation to work, you basically need one hydrogen atom per month. Is it possible we could have missed that? Well, obviously. Imagine a chunk of space as big as a skyscraper. Imagine if you stared at it for a month and an extra atom popped in. Continuous creation sounds like a rabbit out of a hat and it sounds like making stuff up to support your own theory, but actually it's perfectly possible. We've got no way, and there's the important thing in science, we've got no way of proving it wrong. Can we count the atoms in, a, in the Empire State Building? No. And even if we could, it would take longer than a month. So that's just ridiculous. It's never going to happen. It's perfectly possible for that to be happening. There could be a hydrogen atom popping in every month. And that would be enough. Because although we talk about kilometres per second, the expanse of the universe is not that rapid. And that was really all you would need. And then when you came back a billion years later, you would see roughly the same universe. Different stars, different galaxies, but the same sort of density. Okay? And in fact, if you've read Terry Pratchett, you'll know there's an even better way of this happening. Um, continuous creation is clearly true, and you can prove it tonight if you go home in your kitchen. Kitchen drawer, it's got in there. Packet of balloons, fortunately, this morning. Can anybody in the house remember buying them? No. Nope. Marbles, string. Um, those little keys for doing the radiators. Yeah, and those little plastic keys for opening your electricity meter thing on the front. Yeah. Can anybody remember buying them and putting them in there? No. Uh, if you look around the house, CDs, no. Where, who bought that? I've never seen that before. Clearly, you open any drawer, there's bits of string, bits of, you know, bits of chalk, stones, all sorts of things which are being stuffed into the universe. I mean, think about it, a radiator key, how many atoms in that? Like one with 26 noughts. That would keep the whole Milky Way going. You with me? If, if whoever's in charge, like God, can get a single radiator key into the universe without us noticing, then the universe is fine for about the next billion years because there's so many atoms inside there. Okay? So this is the steady state theory. Okay? Fred Hoyle, Herman Bondi, and the other bloke whose name I can't remember. Um, and it does explain what we see. The problem is it doesn't have a beginning. Well, I say problem because people don't like things that have beginnings that don't have ends. But actually, the alternative has exactly those problems. And as I say, a lot of the reasons that people like the Big Bang Theory over the steady state theory is to do with the beginnings and the ends. But actually, uh, this is where most of the problems start. Okay? Um, as I say, Fred Hoyle proposed the steady state theory um, in America. Uh, I think it's a V or a W, I don't know. George Gamow, who'd escaped from uh, Eastern Europe um, after the Second World War, working in America, 
uh, didn't like this theory. And it is a quite a personal thing. Uh, it's quite an interesting bit of science to look at, is the dialogue between Hoyle and Gamow about the steady state theory. It's clear George Gamow just doesn't like it. And it's clear that Fred Hoyle just doesn't like George Gamow. Um, <laughs> and being a Yorkshireman, he's quite uh, vociferous in his, his distaste for him. Um, and what's this got to do with anything? Well, it's to do with the name of it. The Big Bang term was invented by Fred Hoyle. It was meant to be an insult. It was meant to explain why George Gamow's theory can't be true. Hoyle made up the term Big Bang to show that it was just a complete load of rubbish. And that's rather ironic now, that term has stuck with it. Um, George Gamow said, basically, here's the universe, it's awfully big and it's expanding. Well, just play the video backwards. Go back in time, what should you see? Well, obviously, if it's big and expanding, then you'll see it being smaller. And eventually, you'll come back to a point where we're there. OK? Uh, the Big Bang Theory, very easy on the human brain. Very easy on the human brain. The human brain likes the Big Bang Theory. It has a beginning, and it continues, and it'll have some sort of end in the future. A big crunch or a big expansion or something. OK? Um, and it's an interesting, as I say, it's an interesting area of science because quite often um, one side has better evidence than the other. But if you compare the two, which of them explains the expanding universe better? Well, they both explain it perfectly well. Um, many people don't like this because it's got no beginning and no end. And many people like this. The huge problem, I'm sure you've had this, what happened before the Big Bang? The glibber answer is there was no space or time, so there was nothing to exist. In which case, why did it happen? Uh, and this was Hoyle's argument. He basically said this ridiculous theory with its, get it, Big Bang at the beginning, literally, like who lit the touch paper? How can you have that in a scientific theory? Fred Hoyle were here now, uh, he didn't die long, that long ago actually, uh, lived to a ripe old age, but he would have said, well, what's happening here? This, you're now raising questions you can't answer as a scientist. This is not a scientific theory because it has this magic at the beginning. Because this is magic, we have no science to explain what's going on here. We can explain back to about the first three minutes, I think, or whatever it's called. Um, and we can argue about with the CERN particle accelerator what went on here, but we have absolutely nothing for this. This is not a scientific theory, and for that reason, Fred Hoyle made up the name, this ridiculous theory, with the Big Bang at the beginning. All right, Big Bang meant to mean something that was just not scientific. Okay? And up until the 1960s, the two of them fought like cats in a bag, basically. Um, because that neither could prove the other wrong. It was like in ancient Greece thousands of years ago, some people thought things were made of atoms, and some people didn't. And because they had slaves to do the washing up and stuff, they just sat and argued. You know, there's great Greek philosophers who wrote great books about atoms, and ones who wrote books about there not being atoms. And this went on for hundreds of years, because to do an experiment to prove it, they just couldn't do that. Okay? To finish this off, though, there are two important discoveries in the 1960s. Many great things happened in the 1960s, including me. Um, but there are two things that you need to know about, okay, which definitely tip the balance. So think of it like that. These two theories, and they are theories at the moment, both explain the expanding universe. They have their issues. They have their strengths. They, have their, they certainly have their supporters. Um, uh, the first discovery was, has a very grand name, uh, thought she has an acronym, which will be led off. It's called the Cosmic Microwave Background Radiation, or CMBR to you. Cosmic Microwave Background Radiation. We'll explain each of those words in turn. Um, now, this discovery was made, as you probably know, there was a lot of radio technology left after the Second World War. The invention of radar and things like that meant there was lots of radio technology, radio engineers, and in America, there were two radio astronomers, Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson. And what they were thinking of doing was making a radio map of the sky. Now, let's just think what that means. You can go into a shop and buy a star map, and it will show you a lovely picture of the night sky with little white dots on. In fact, Um, you know, it's got like bits of sky and little white dots on to show you the stars. And if you think about it, a star map like you buy in a shop is a light map. It shows you the areas of bright light, like that star, that star, that star. Penzias and Wilson said, let's produce a radio map. Now that would mean 
a map of the sky that showed you where there were bright bits of radio signals. All right? Now, obviously, a lot of the stars, all, almost all the stars produce radio, but there are some interesting bits of sky where there aren't any stars, where we do get radio coming. All right? So what they were planning to do was to make, essentially, a radio map of the sky. And it would be very similar to the star map of the sky, but it would have some very interesting areas where radio signals were quite strong, but actually there wasn't a star there. All right? And this eventually takes us into things like discovery of the black holes and all those sorts of things. But there are parts of the sky where you get very strong radio waves, but there is, it's, not, uh, it's not explained by a star. There must be something else there. And what they did, if you look on the web, you can see a picture of their radio telescope. It's a strange looking thing. It doesn't look like most radio telescopes, which look like sky dishes. Uh, it's very directional. They could look at very small sections of the sky with it. Okay. And they started off with this, and the first thing they did, of course, was to get the thing set up. They found a piece of sky with no radio signal, and they pointed their telescope at it, and expected it to read zero, and it didn't. And they spent quite a long time, they spent ages trying to work out why, when they pointed their radio telescope at a piece of blank sky, they didn't get zero signal. Uh, they climbed inside and found that pigeons had been living in it, and basically pooing all over it. So these two guys, who would eventually win a Nobel Prize for this, spent the first month of their research, with, literally with Brillo pads, scrubbing the pigeon poo wow. off the telescope. They tried it all again and still got this problem. They would point their telescope in a certain direction, and what they got were these three centimetre wavelength. Now, that wavelength of light is a ten millionth of a metre. This is much longer than light. This is into the microwave region. Not the one we use for cooking, but similar. Um, they found these very short radio waves, that's what microwaves are. They found these short microwaves, three centimetre wavelength. And they thought, well, that's a bit strange, because we've looked and looked, there clearly is nothing there. There's not like a star producing them or something. And then they found very strangely, if they pointed the telescope in a completely different direction, then what they found was exactly the same thing. And if they pointed their telescope in yet another direction, they found exactly the same thing. Now, let's just think through the thought process here. We've got our radio telescope. We want to point it at the stars and get a reading. We want to point it at interesting areas of the sky where we know there are radio signals. We point it at a part of the sky where there's not meant to be any radio signals, and we get these three centimetre radio waves, three centimetre microwaves. What would your first thought be? What do you think? Perhaps there is something there. Perhaps there's something we don't know about producing these three centimetre radio waves. If that was the case... What would happen as you moved your telescope away? What would happen to the strength of the radio waves? As you moved it away from this mysterious source of three centimetre radio waves, what would happen to the strength of the signal? It should fade. No, it doesn't. It stays exactly the same. This is the important word. They're not coming from anywhere. They're coming from everywhere. All right? That's the most important word in this. Cosmic is just to make it look sexy. Microwave is because it's microwaves. Background, it's entirely like background. Think what that word means. It's an entirely background effect. And their first thought was, oh, perhaps we've discovered a, a, a magic source of three centimetre radio waves. And they move the telescope around and they get exactly... I mean, in fact, if you take the telescope, three centimetre radio waves, measure the strength of them, point the telescope in the opposite direction, you get exactly the same signal. All right. So very important, if you want to sort of translate this in your margin, the important one here is background radiation. The microwaves that Penzias and Wilson discovered were coming from everywhere. No matter what direction you point your telescope, you get exactly the same strength of three centimetre microwaves. So they concluded, therefore, the universe is essentially full of three centimetre Radio waves. And where are they coming from? They're not coming from anywhere. They're coming from everywhere. As I said, in CMBR, the most important word is the B. Okay? Cosmic microwave background radiation. The universe is full of microwaves. Now, does this prove the steady state theory wrong? If Fred Hoyle were here, well, it's just what universes do. In a million years' time, it'll still be full of microwaves. Not a problem at all. The interesting thing is the relationship between this and the Big Bang Theory, okay? And the story goes that, uh, I think it was Arno Penzias, went to a conference um, in, in America somewhere to listen to people delivering scientific papers, and he happened to sit next to, at coffee time, he happened to sit next to 
one of the guys who was working with George Gamow on the Big Bang Theory. And as you do, you'd say, where are you from? Well, what are you working on at the moment? And the guys working with George Gamow had said, well, basically, if the universe goes back and back in time and gets smaller and smaller and smaller, two things will happen. Firstly, the early universe will be very hot indeed. Its temperature will go down, obviously, as it expands. But at the beginning of the universe, it would have been very, very hot. And the only way we can make that work is if the universe is full of... Well, when the universe first started, it would have been full of the really shortest electromagnetic waves, gamma rays. As the universe expands, then it would have been full of X-rays. These waves would get stretched as the universe expands. So if you went back to the universe of a few million years after the Big Bang, you would find it completely full of X-rays. And a bit later on, you'd find it completely full of light waves. And if the universe happened from a Big Bang about four and a half billion years ago, then the universe now should be full of microwaves with a wavelength of three centimetres. And this is the reason I think many scientists suddenly started taking notice of this. Often in, in science, someone has a great theory and then they get the telescope out and go and try and prove it. These two things were done completely, ironically, about 50 miles away from each other, but intellectually they were done completely independently. The guys working on the, um, with George Gamow from the Big Bang Theory found the only way they could make it work is if our universe now is full of three centimetre microwaves, which thought, they thought was a bit stupid, really. And they worked quite hard on the theory to get rid of them. <laughs> Just down the road, Penzias and Wilson were trying to do their radio map and kept finding these three centimetre microwaves. And it was literally two people from one person from each of these groups happened to bump into each other what are you doing? Well, we're trying to map the sky. We keep finding these three centimetre radio waves. What are you doing? We're trying to invent the Big Bang Theory, but it keeps predicting the universe is full of three centimetres. And it's not three, it's 2.7 something, and the agreement is really good. All right? This doesn't prove the steady state theory wrong, but this is a really spectacular piece of science. We like the idea that people do experiments and they do theories independently of each other. In practice, if you look at the history of science, that's quite rare. And this is a spectacular example of two groups working totally independently, coming up with exactly the same answer. The theory predicts exactly this, and that's exactly what Penzias and Wilson found. And they were radio engineers. What was their interest in trying to prove the Big Bang Theory right? None. None whatsoever. They may not have even heard of it. Okay? So this was a massive tick in favour of the Big Bang Theory. At this point, many astronomers, many scientists started taking notes of the Big Bang Theory. Not because this proves the steady state theory wrong, but it's these microwaves, these cosmic microwave background, is exactly what the Big Bang Theory predicts. To conserve energy, you have to have all this energy whizzing around as electromagnetic waves, and as the universe gets bigger, the waves get longer, and if the universe is about four and a half billion years old, they should be about three centimeter wavelength waves, which is microwaves, and that's exactly what we find, okay? Many people continue to believe the steady state theory, or to sit with it. Um, the one that really caused it problems towards the end of the 1960s was the discovery of quasars, or if you prefer, QSOs, which stands for quasi-stellar object. Let me write it down. Okay. Uh, quasars, or quasi-stellar objects. Now, the good news is, we're not going to spend a great deal of time worrying about what they are. Um, the important thing is their discovery. Um, quasars were essentially the end of the steady state theory. If you're here on the Earth, inside the local group, and you look out into space, and you look a very long way away, you look right, astronomers define what we call the edge of the observable universe. Okay? Basically, where you look so far away, think about Hubble's law, if you look one megaparsec away, they're doing 50 kilometres per second. If you look two megaparsecs away, they're doing 100. What's going to be the limit to that then? Yeah, can you imagine looking so far away, I don't know how many 50s there are on the speed of light. You look so far away, you see a gas doing the speed of light. Can you see things any further? You can't, can you? When you get to a point where objects are moving at the speed of light, so there is quite sensibly what we call the edge of the observable universe. Okay? If you look right up to that sort of point, so you're looking billions and billions of light years away, very importantly, you're looking back into the past. 
Now, this is quite a simple idea to do with space and time, but it's not one you really come across on the Earth. You're not seeing me as I am now. You're seeing me as I was about a squillionth of a second ago because the light that hits me and reflects off me and goes into your eyes, that takes, depends where you're sitting, obviously, but it takes about a squillionth of a second to get to you. Um, have you heard about the sun? If the sun went out, was it four or was it eight minutes? It's about eight minutes, isn't it? So you can imagine if the sun had a pull cord and somebody pulled the sun so the light went out. What would we notice on the Earth? Nothing, because you imagine, can you imagine the last light wave to leave the sun? It's going to take it about eight and a half minutes to get to the Earth. Um, and those probes to Mars and things like that, you know, the problems of sending radio signals, they take several hours for the signals to get there and so on. So, in fact, if you look at the sun, which you can almost do that, if you look at the sun, are you seeing the sun as it is now? You're not, are you? You're seeing the sun as it was about eight and a half minutes ago. If you look at the moon, it's about three quarters of a second. So if you look at the moon, you're seeing the moon as it was three quarters of a second ago. These things don't really matter, but if you look at the nearest star, as you probably know, that's four and a half light years away. So if you look at the nearest star, you're seeing as it was four and a half years ago. If you look at, um, there are stars in the night sky, bright ones that you can see, which are hundreds of light years away, you're seeing them as they were in the 1900s. You with me? Uh, sorry, you look in the 1900s, 1800s, 1700s. There are stars many hundreds of light years away, and as you look out into space, you're looking back in time. Okay? Now, astronomers found, as they looked very, very close to the edge of the observable universe, a long way back into the life of the universe, they found little dots. Now, on this scale, as I said, I think, at the start of this section, when we're doing this section, every dot on the board isn't a star, it's a galaxy. All right? The scale of cosmology, we're basically dealing with the universe, which is full of galaxies. All right? um, what would a planet or a star look like on this scale? It'd be too small even to mention. Okay? But astronomers were quite surprised. Instead of seeing galaxies, which is what you normally see, they saw dots. Things that look like, get it? Stars. Quasi-stellar. They look like stars. What's the problem with seeing a star at that distance? Why can't they be stars? This is a dis Imagine a galaxy of 100 billion stars. At this distance, that almost looks like a dot. So something that really did look like a dot, just like a single star, why can't it be a single star at that distance? What would you expect a single star to look at if it was that far away? You'd hardly be able to see it, would you? All right. So at that distance, that we're talking here pretty much across the other side of the universe. A single dot, that's why they're called quasi-stellar objects, because they can't be stars. Because if they were single stars, how much light are they giving out? About the same as a galaxy. So that's what quasars are. They're little star-like dots which are giving out enough light energy, think about it, to make themselves visible across the whole universe. They're stars that are giving out the same light output as a galaxy. Now that's very strange indeed. And later on we'll come back to what quasars are. But the interesting thing is, you see them close to the edge of the observable universe, at middle distances from the local group, you don't see any quasars. And close to the local group, you don't see any quasars. Can anyone see why this is the end of the steady state theory? Were there any quasars four and a half years ago? No. Were there any quasars 400 years ago? 4,000, 4 million? About 4 billion years ago, there were quasars, weren't there? Think what you're looking at when you're looking at quasars. You're looking at the universe it was not long after the Big Bang. And what do you see? Yeah, you see galaxies. But you also see these strange things called quasars. In a sense, it doesn't matter what quasars are. But the important thing is you only see them at enormous distances from the Earth. Now, what does that mean? It means they only existed a very long time ago. This is the very early universe. This is the middle bit of the universe's life, whatever that means. And this is now. Yeah? Did quasars exist here and here? No, they didn't. All right? Whatever quasars were, and that's the important word in that sentence, whatever quasars were, 
they're not anymore. If you look 100 light years from the local group, how many quasars do you see? Absolutely none. All right? So how many quasars were there 100 years ago? There weren't any. There weren't any 1,000 years ago, or 100,000, or 10,000, or a million, or 1,000 million. But billions of years ago, there were. So this is the early universe, and the rest of the universe. And the problem is here, of course, they're not the same. Do you remember Fred Hall's steady state theory? The universe is the same in terms of space, which it is. The universe should be the same in terms of time. It isn't. All right? At the time that Hoyle proposed his theory, we didn't really have the technology to look this far back. But as the 1960s went on, this became possible to do. And it became very clear the early universe, it's got things like galaxies in, yet things that we see nowadays, but it contains objects like quasars and AGNs and stuff like that, which you just don't see. Whatever they were, they only existed billions of years ago, which suggests the early universe and the current universe, whatever that means, aren't the same thing. And at this point, most people stopped taking any notes of the steady state theory. All right? If this is true, and it clearly is, the steady state theory can't be true. The problem is, of course, though, we're now stuck with the Big Bang Theory. Remember, that's an insult. That's not a selling point. We now have the huge problem of explaining, well, we're not doing too badly here, explaining what the universe was like close to the Big Bang. You see those famous diagrams of the universe sort of exploding out. What happened beforehand, though, is, is the legacy of this theory. It does, it does have a beginning, which means you ask the question, what happened beforehand? Okay. Um, we're actively looking at what the universe might do later on. As I said, it's a simple balancing act between gravity and expansion. And just to round off, if you wanted to decide what the universe is going to do, there's a famous graph you can draw, which looks like this. This is the size of the universe against time. Uh, the universe might do that, it might do that. Or it might do that. Yeah? We're here, and we've been watching it for not very long, so we don't really know. The universe might expand. I mean, basically, it's the seesaw. Who's going to win? Gravity or expansion? The universe might just expand, 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 and just become bigger and bigger and bigger. And that sounds great with the housing problem and all that sort of stuff. There'd be loads of room for everybody. But it would eventually expand to a point where there were three feet between every atom. You with me? Space would expand so much, there would be three feet between every atom in the universe. What could exist then? Nothing. All right? So this isn't particularly cheery. This one's not much better. This is where gravity wins, can you see? The universe expands out for a bit, but gravity turns it around and brings it back in. If this is the Big Bang, this has been referred to as the Big Crunch. And what happens after that, we don't know. OK. Um, this one's quite nice, where the universe just expands out and sits there. And that would be quite nice. Uh, for that, you need gravity to be pretty close to the force of expansion. Um, and astronomers are busy trying to measure these two things. This is nicely measured, but I've rubbed it off now. Do you remember our 50 kilometres per second per megaparsec? That's why astronomers want to measure the Hubble constant, because it tells you how strongly the universe is expanding. To measure how strongly gravity pulls in is quite simple. You just need to know the mass of the entire universe. Um, which sounds like a bit of a tricky job to do. In actual fact, it's quite easy. You just get a telescope and you look at a one degree by one degree square. Can you imagine that? And you count how many stars and galaxies as far as you can see, and you estimate their mass, and then you just times by 360 twice. Do you follow? Um, so that's the kind of thing astronomers have been doing. And what they found, of course, a lot of matter which doesn't shine, which is referred to as, I'm sure you've heard of it, dark matter. This is where dark matter came from. People trying to answer this question as to which one's going to win, once you start trying to measure the mass of the universe, you find possibly three quarters of the mass of the universe doesn't shine. We obviously start up by counting the stars and the bright things. And again, that's a topic we'll come back to a bit later on. Okay? But this is currently the model that we have of our universe. It started off with a big bang four and a half million years ago, billion years ago. It's expanded out ever since. It's full of cosmic microwave backgrounds. What it might do in the future, we're not totally sure. Although, these two things can't be very different, actually. If you can imagine doing this piece of science, if you get, like, a million for that one and 25 for that one, you'd think, yeah, well, in that case, gravity's going to win and I've got a good margin of error. The thing that cosmologists find is these two always come very close to each other, which is really annoying, because if your gravity was a bit out in your estimates, 
you follow. But actually, the universe needs those two things to be very close to each other. If gravity was a tiny bit stronger, the universe would all be over in about a thousand years, and vice versa. So the universe does kind of, whatever we're going to find, it is quite close to this one. If it does go that way or that way, it will be quite close to this one. The universe does sort of sit literally on a knife edge between those two forces.